Resident Evil is, for want of a better phrase, a weird series. There's nothing else really like it. Combining gut-wrenching horror with absurd camp, it luxuriates in the B-movie schlock of its source material while doing everything in its power to scare the shit out of you. It's the grandfather of survival horror and the patient zero of infamously wild tonal shifts, and what makes it stand out is that there's an earnestness to its discord that makes it endearing rather than eye-rolling. Resident Evil 2's recent High Fidelity remake continues this trend. It's a title that builds upon the original's solid core with incredible atmospheric flourish, and a new perspective that turns even its weakest shambling duds into potential death traps. It's a game that goes the extra mile to have the player fear every corner, every footstep, groan and shadow. It's scary, a revamped classic that to my mind wholly justifies its absurd level of polish, but it still retains that staple goofiness, still to dialogue and terrible one-liners that are performed just as badly by the non-union voice cast Capcom hired because they are bad bastards. To be honest, I don't really have any sharp or insightful criticism of Remake 2 that you couldn't find elsewhere. I loved my time with it, even though I categorically had a bad time with it. I thought the tyrant Mr. X was a great disruptive foe whose daft appearance somehow only heightened my terror whenever he appeared. I found myself riveted by how the game made you feel like you were constantly brushing death's door, making your eventual push through to the next safe room all the more satisfying. I like that it's a five hour experience, providing reason to go back again before the atrophy sets in but at your call, not the games. It's a great reimagining of a classic and, while not without flaws, it sets a high standard for not only remakes but survival horror in general. But these comments don't warrant their own video. There are far better and more competent critics out there than I, expressing identical affirmations in more eloquent terms. So instead, what I want to talk about is something a little different. A reaction to a small design choice that appears to set up something truly great that never quite emerges. Not a flaw. Not something that would necessarily fit the source material even. But rather, an instance of immersion I'd like to see other designers think about when approaching future projects. An organic integration of narrative and mechanic whose spark of origin centers around not the dead, but the living. One of the first survivors you come across, Marvin Branner, is doomed from the get-go. Suffering a sizable abdominal wound, the steadfast officer grounds you for the game's first act. A familiar face to return to if the dark hallways and fleshy terrors become too much. You're reunited with your injured comrade multiple times as you loop through the station, and he inevitably becomes a mental checkpoint to signify your progress towards escaping the frying pan for the inviting glow of the fire beyond. Upon each return, Marvin's health gets progressively worse, and eventually he succumbs to the big sleep, only to be reborn a groaning husk that screams to the player that even this hub area is no longer safe. The slow burn of Marvin's fate is an incredible bit of incidental storytelling that's not replicated anywhere else in the game. An ally turned foe brings a traumatically human context to the disaster unfolding before you, and they do it here far better than any cutscene could. But you can't interact with Marvin, nor take any action to change his fate, and that's fine. It's not the game's remit to offer branching narratives, nor to jam dialogue choices where they don't belong. As a tight, curated experience, it already excels, and no additions could guarantee improvement. What this moment signalled to me, however, is that there is a huge missed opportunity in games like these when it comes to the inclusion of NPCs and elements of world building. Developers pool their talents to create these beautifully realised landscapes, often filling them with tiny adjacent bits of organic narrative that help bring environments to life. Even the dreaded audio logs work in some instances, offering the player an optional anecdotal addition to seek out and enjoy. But there's a common theme among these, especially in survival horror, in that this exploration of a world's history is almost always in the past tense, and some might say, trapped there. Dead men, in fact, 
do tell tales, and often they're the only ones who do. Resident Evil 2 is a game that has a lot of micro-narratives hidden within its walls, in overt methods like notes and videotapes, and in more subtle nods like a photograph of a very good boy on an officer's desk, or a cheeky challenge for a new rookie cop on what would have been his first day. It tells the story of a world before its end, of ordinary lives before the fall, people going about their daily business. Yet for all its flourish, it offers up very little for the still living, and Resident Evil 2's survivors are genuinely intriguing, their stories something for which to sit upright and pay attention, which makes the meagre scraps after the fact all the more frustrating. I wanted to know more about my shutter door saviour, about the paths that led the two protagonists to end up in this particular apocalypse, about the fractured relationships of the Birkin family, the traumatised gun shop owner and the dead woman in the orphanage. There's a lot of stuff going on in the game beyond Leon and Claire acting like horny teens whenever they see each other, and so very little of it is explored in-game. So. Understanding that Resident Evil 2 is first and foremost a survival horror game, an interactive experience about a solitary figure pitted against an army of ghoulish apparitions and whose storytelling is the festive bow and not the gift itself, understanding all this is an experiment to think about. What if you, the player, could delay the inevitable fate of Marvin Branagh, sacrificing one of your own dwindling supply of first aid sprays to keep him going just a little bit longer. You couldn't cure him, but in keeping him alive you could learn more about who he is. A reckless act of kindness that doesn't benefit you mechanically, but offers what would ultimately be a more meaningful choice. A deliberate and pointed defiance of the idiom that survival is the only thing that matters, that the terminal nature of life during a pandemic demands no empathy. Often we have games offer up a wealth of minutiae in its environments that effectively do nothing, and it can leave the player feeling frustrated when a title doesn't follow its own logic. In Remake 2, this is exacerbated by how well rendered these environments are, and because the game does in fact, lay the groundwork for this kind of hypothetical storytelling. Resident Evil's inventory system has a physicality and weight to it. Not through encumbrance or the incredible Tetris stylings of 4, it's more an abstract feeling. There's a tangibility to it. Bejeweled keys slot into respective doors with a satisfying click. Chains fall to the ground with a hefty clunk as you snap them in two with your bolt cutters. There are no essentials kept in their own submenu. The limits on what you can carry work for both weapons and key items alike. Solving a puzzle requires more than player presence, but also an awareness of what components they need to bring with them. I know this design isn't for everyone, and it is kind of stupid that a grenade launcher and a herb take up the same amount of space, but what I like about this is that it makes each component of the road to escape a conscious burden. As much as you have to suspend your disbelief in some of the more absurd solutions to your barriers to progress, the shared space that these items inhabit means that they feel like they belong in the world. As such, a first aid spray isn't just an abstract MacGuffin to undo a sloppy mistake. It exists within the world. Instructions on how to combine herbs or gunpowder are written in-universe. Therefore, canonically, it isn't much of a stretch to suggest that they could be used by someone other than Leon or Claire. While a small niggle in an overwhelmingly accomplished game series, the implication of this divide between the player and the survivors of Raccoon City is that inanimate objects are instilled with greater agency than human beings. I went into this project fully honest about my lamentations being a symptom of the desire to see Resident Evil 2 as a game that it categorically is not. I used to think it was a series that didn't really know what it was, but that's not true at all, is it? It's about exploding appendages and giant pulsating eyeballs, about juxtaposing its dank, blindingly dark corridors with ridiculous B-movie set pieces. The tyrant is wearing a flasher coat and fedora for Christ's sake. It's a game about shooting the things that go bump in the night, in the face, 
with a shotgun, with all the grace and tact of a Neville Dean and Taylor movie. And it gets away with this because it's often really, really bloody good at what it does. So, what's the point of this video then? The way we talk about features in games is often as a binary critique, treating them as contraptions that we assign value to, and judge them for their additions and omissions, and always in isolation. We can learn from what games don't do at all as much as we can from what they do right or wrong, and we needn't necessarily ascribe a penalty to this in the process. This video was inspired by something entirely absent from a game, from the spaces between its systems. And, admittedly, it's easy to talk hypothetically when you're not the one tasked with coding these additional nuances into an already infinitely complex creature, but what is a critic's job if not to take the seat of a potential audience? See the world through their eyes, regardless of how much knowledge of the inner workings. But to also allow a creator to see the fruits of their labour in a different light. And I hope it's not too arrogant of me to assume that I'm not the only one who feels this way. Games can be blunt and brutish and about as subtle as a neon sign. That's their right and their privilege. But they can also be something more. And I hope one day that more games become bold enough to do so.